we have studied communication security for quite some time. In communication security, we have uh, Alice communicating with Bob under the influence of a malicious man in the middle. Today, we are going to talk about something different, uh, going into computer security. In computer security or system security, okay, we have a, a computer systems, okay, operate on many data, carry out computation, carry out computation on the data. And the security issue is kind of different from a communication uh, security where it's just about sending of information. One issue that we want to study is on access control. Access control. And what is access control? Essentially, okay, in the access control model, we have many subjects. We have subjects who want to operate on objects. Subjects are, for example, um, user in a computer system, uh, the user in the Facebook, and in the Luminous, the students, uh, lecturers who use the system. The objects, okay, objects could be false. For example, a user want to read, write, or delete uh, objects. In the numinous examples, the objects, uh, the subjects could be uh, the uh, students who want to upload a file to the work bin, or a student who want to post a message on the forum page. And um, such system. It's quite uh, the access control is uh, what is access control? Access control essentially is about uh, restricting the operation. We don't want to have a free for all situation where any subject can access any objects. We want to impose uh, some restrictions. There are also non-computer uh, system example. For example, like uh, in the buildings, okay, each subject uh, uh, a tenant in the buildings, and the building has uh, many uh, rooms. Okay, the building has many rooms. Okay, we don't want to allow any person to enter freely enter any rooms. We want to have some uh, restrictions. So why do we need to have access control? Why do we want to have uh, restrictions? Okay. So of course there are some objects that is more sensitive that uh, we do uh, that is only accessible for certain uh, uh, users. Also, access control allow us to build what we call security par parameters or security boundary. So as we have mentioned quite a few times, there's something called uh, zero day vulnerabilities and there are also uh, insider attacks. So it is very hard to achieve a completely secure systems. So now if we have a security boundary, okay, if we can define a boundary, okay, uh, over here, this example, okay, and if there is a attacker or if this system is compromised, for example, the insider attacks, okay, or the, there are some uh, vulnerability, zero day vulnerability being discovered, okay, and we want to have the security boundary okay, to contain the effect of the attacks. So with the boundary, okay, we can achieve something what we call com compartmentizations. Okay. 
you can imagine the situation like uh, this is a, a boat okay, in a boat if very typically in the design of a boat there's a compartment why do we want a compartment okay if case there is a, some malfunction there's a leakage here okay this water will be filled up and then it will not be spilled over to all the regions all the whole things And how do we design the compartment? Okay, this is guided by a few principles. For example, thing like a layer defense, we want to have a different layers, and the something called principle of least beverage, which we are going to talk about later. Last week, we touched on firewall design. Firewall design. Okay, firewall in fact is a access control. Uh, mechanisms in our example last week we place the sql server let's put sql server here and the web server in two different zones in two different zones okay. why do we do that okay so if we put it in two different zones in the unfortunate event that the web server is compromised okay which is quite possible because web server is in what we call the DMZ, which is the nearest to the, uh, which is discoverable by the internet. Okay, if the web server is compromised, <coughs> with compartmentation with the boundary, we can contain the, the the effect. Okay, we can contain the attacker to these regions. So some definitions. Okay. I've actually I've more or less mentioned this uh, already. Okay, in the access control, we define something called a subjects and the objects. And the subjects want to operate on the objects. In this picture here, these are the objects. This is the subjects. The subject want to operate on the objects. And we also need what we call a reference monitor. Okay, in this picture here is this security guard over here. Okay, when a subject want to operate on objects, he will send a request to the reference monitor, the security guard, and the security guard will based on the policy access control policy to decide whether to grant or deny the access. So here are some examples of objects, subjects, okay, and the operations. Okay. So you may be familiar with this. Okay. Uh, in your uh, mobile phones, you probably have installed uh, apps on Torchlight. Okay. And the Torchlight may want to access to the phone. You want to make phone call. Or the Torchlight want to access to the contact list. And there are cases where the apps want to read files generated by NR apps. Okay. Whether we want to allow this or not, that is defined by our access control model. Some more definitions. Okay. Uh, principle and subjects, a lot of time we just treat as one act, but uh, they, they have a difference. Okay. Principles, we usually refer to a single uh, a user. Subjects are entity that operate on behalf of the principal. So you can imagine that the uh, particular user, let's say Alice, when he use a computer system, she may uh, in evoke or run many applications. Okay, those ap every application or every program uh, started or evoked by Alice is formed as a subject, but but Alice is the principal. And here are the possible action operation can be done on the uh, objects. Okay, in particular, we are uh, this three uh, of particular concern to us is that uh, to read, to write, or to execute. Okay, to carry out uh, computations. Every object have an owner. So like in the Facebook, 
you may create a image, okay, upload the image. Or in a luminous, a student uh, create post a message in the forum page. Okay. Then that message, the owner of that message is the student. The student create the message. Now who decide the access right to an object? Okay. In one setting, okay, in one setting, it could be what we call DAC, discretionary access control. The creator or the owner of the object decide who can operate on the objects. For example, when you upload, when you post an uh, image in Facebook, you are uh, as a user, you can indicate who can read, who can view this image. Okay. However, there could be a system-wide policy. That means the student, uh, the owner cannot decide. Uh, as examples, if a student posts a message in a forum page, suppose the message is a message, message have the bodies and the header. The header could be the name, appear name of the person who posts the message. Now, if you post a message in the forum page, can you decide whether your name, can you decide that your name not to be displayed? Okay, for Illuminous, okay, so this is not allowed. Okay, your name has to be displayed, always displayed. So this becomes a system-wide policy. It cannot be decided by the owner of the message. Okay. So now we have uh, many objects and many subjects and a set of operations. Okay. Now who can how do we describe who can access what? Okay. A very simple way or uh, intuitive method is to define using a huge table. So in this table, the column correspond to objects and the row correspond to the subjects. Okay. So for this file, my.c, and the root. Okay. If the root have the read and write access, then we put it here. Okay. The entry for every cell indicate the operations that's allowed for this subject on the objects. Okay. In my notation here, O mean owner. So root is the owner of these objects called SUDO. And there, you can imagine that there could be uh, could be many uh, empty entries, yeah, many empty entries. So this completely describes the the access control. However, this table is very big. Okay. Suppose the objects, let's say typical fast, let's say in the Facebook, uh, how many images have been uploaded in Facebook? There could be millions or hundred millions of them. And how many users does a Facebook have? Okay. So this table would be anonymous, uh, right? Very huge table. So very often this table is not explicitly stored as a table. Because it's very sparse, very sparse, okay. One way to store it is to treat it as a sparse matrix and use link list to store it. Link list. There are two ways to, to use a linked list. Okay. One is that um, we look at every column, we replace every row as a linked list. Okay, so this row corresponds to this linked list, this corresponds to, uh, sorry, in this picture is every column. Okay. Clear everything first. So in these pictures, okay, every column, okay, 
correspond to winding disk, every column corresponds to winding disk. Okay. And we skip the empty uh, cells. Yeah. This type of representation is called access control list. It's just a name, access control list. An alternative representation is every rows represented as a list. This is called capabilities. Um, so like for example, these roads, okay, this list indicate the capability of this user root. Uh, the user has the capability to read and write or my.c, has the capability of read and execute on this and so on. These two representations, okay, have some indication on the efficiency in the usage. Okay, these two data structures. Okay. What is the indications? For example, let's con consider a fast system that use access control list. In fact, many fast systems use ACL. In this fast system, if a file is being deleted, if a file is being deleted, then we just have to go to here and delete this file, this line. Now, what if a user, a user, a subject is being deleted? Then there is a complication. That means we have to go to every line here to, to, to delete the user. Or more practical situation, let's in this file system, suppose the system admin want to know how many files Bob has or what is the total, total storage space used by Bob. Okay. In this representation, we have to go through every list to find, to count the number of files and storage used by Bob. Likewise, if the file system use a capability as a representation, okay, if you want to know how many files used by Bob, very easy, we just come to here and count. Okay. But now if a file is being deleted, a file is being deleted, then we have to go through all the lists and remove the entry in the list. So this definitely is a very, uh, computationally uh, intensive, you have to scan through all the lists. So for either we are using ACL or capability, this size is still huge. This size is still huge. And more importantly is, uh, is very inconvenient for a user, okay? Suppose that, uh, let's say that in the Facebook example again, suppose a user, suppose you have uh, 200 friends, okay? And now you want to post an image. Okay? After you post an image or photograph, do you have to specify each individual friends you have who can read and write, uh, who can view these images? Uh, you have to post an image, then after you, you post an image, specify that Alice can see this, Bob cannot see this, Charles can see this, uh, Dave cannot see this, and so on. You have to do it for every single user. Okay. So we don't. Okay, this will be very tedious. Okay. And very tedious and also very difficult to keep track who can see what. As such, we need some method where we call intermediate control. Basically, it's about grouping. Okay. This is, this in fact, is the main challenge in access control uh, mechanism. Okay, the access control mechanism is not on the main technical challenge. Uh, it's not on how the reference monitor, the security guard is to be designed to be implement a lot of time is on how do we define the grouping a reasonable grouping so that it is fine grain that means that we can specify uh, what can be done on an individual uh, item 
and meet the security boundary requirement and most importantly very easy to manage okay if it's not easy to manage very likely the human will able will make mistakes and then lead to vulnerabilities okay so for uh was stressed last week that firewall design could be very complicated very complex and because it's very complex there's a lot of bugs and loophole so what is an example of a grouping okay let's use unix file system as an example unit file system in the unit file system a user every user can belong to a groups belong to a groups so now if alice in this case alice create a file the file called temp okay alice can specify okay the read write access to this file for his group member alice just has to mention that okay for this group the people in this group can read my files okay the number of people in this group could be many could be 100 200 but alice just had to make one specification Okay, just make a single specification or maybe you can say it's one click then he specified the access right for one whole group okay, this simplified the the definition of the access control likewise in numulus numulus okay as a lecturer i can create project groups i can create project groups okay object created by uh, by member in the groups can only read by member in that groups and lecturers and the groups in the unix okay is uh, uh can only be created by the system admins and the information actually is stored in this file you want to take a look so you can see that the grouping is to simplify the definition uh, of uh, specification of the access control in some system we use the term beverage okay to decide who can access what okay and in my example here uh, there's a three beverage level level one two three three is higher than two two is higher than one so all the subject will be given a beverage number for example in this example five user five be given one and user one is given beverage three uh, beverage, the highest beverage can read objects of all the objects okay and lower beverage can only read objects of the lower beverage let me clear the the pen the easiest is that i get out and get back in Okay, let's continue. Sorry for the delay. There's another type of uh, intermediate control is what we call rule-based uh, access control. Okay. So the user in the system, um, the user may play certain roles for uh, like in the luminous, a user could be a, a lecturer, a user could be a student or user can be a TA and the for every role there's a some we want to predefine the access right for the role uh, example is that the TA you know uh, as a TA you have to uh, sometimes you help the lecturer to key in the student grade okay. so for a TA to do a job okay then the TA must uh, should have the access to the the right access to the grade book. Okay, so he can key in the grade. So these are predefined access right for a TA. 
when a user join, let's say you find join, then he is given the role of uh, the TA, then U5 would inherit all the right given to the TA. In this case, U4, U4 join as a TA, and it just happened that U4 have, is also a student in the group. This is also possible. Now, when we want to decide or decide what are the access rights of this role for, let's say, TA, we have to decide what is TA can access. Typically, we should, we, we should follow the so-called the least favorite principle. That means we only give the TA the sufficient rights so that he is able to complete his task. Okay. Thing that is not necessary, we do not give access. Like write access to the great books. The great books, we have to write access to the great books. Okay, we have to give it to the TA. Other, if not, he's not unable to key in the exam, exam grade. However, should we grant the TA the right to delete a great book, generate? Okay. So now, if you look at all the role, the task, responsibility of a TA, if this is not required, then we don't give. Okay. So uh, in Singlish, we should say this in some sense is uh, what we call kiasu uh, or kiasi, right? If not required, it should be kiasi. That means that if not required, then we don't give him. And okay, a technical name is a least privilege principle. Uh, many OS use another terminology called protection ring, protection rings. This is very similar to the privilege uh, system. Okay. So every object and every subject is assigned a number, the ring number. Okay. Uh, in this example here is 0, 1, 2, 3. In Unix, there's only two ring, super user, and user. Smaller number is uh, of higher privilege and lower number, a uh, bigger number is a uh, lower privilege. So a subject, like process, a process is subjects, a process is a computations, okay, a processes, a process, a high privilege process can read and write high privilege objects and lower privilege objects. A low privilege sub process can only read write the low privilege objects. So this is a form of groupings. This is uh, quite intuitive. Okay, what else can we have? Okay, in here he said that high can read write high and read write low. Low can only read write low. It's low cannot read write high. Okay. This is not allowed. We'll, can we have a different versions? Very interestingly, there is. Okay, this comes to a two model called Bell La Polula and Pipa model. And even more interesting, these two are completely opposite of each other, and they both make sense. So what are they? Okay, this picture is easier. Okay. Let's look at these pictures. So under the model, every subject likewise is have given a label. Okay, it's a high or low. High means higher privilege, low means a lower privilege. There can be a multiple layer here. In this example, we only show two binary, high and low. Likewise, object can be high or low. In the Bell model, it's what we call no read up, no write down. No read up, no write down. Okay. So in, under this restriction, okay, a high level processors can read write high. Okay, a low can read write low. The high level it can read 
a low level object. He can fetch a low level object going up this way. However, a low level object cannot, cannot, okay, this is not allowed, it's not allowed to go this way. Okay, this direction is not allowed. And for writing, for writing, the low level can write into the high level. A low level can modify high level objects, but the high level processes cannot write uh, a low level objects or modify a low level objects. That's why we say that there is a no read up, and this one is no write down. So what does this achieve? Okay. You look at this, then there's no way for information to flow from the high level object down to here. There's no way. Okay. No information coming down. Okay. It's not possible for high level process, read the information and then write it down. That's why we don't have no write down. Okay. There's a high level process, read from here and write it down. Is it possible? No, because our access control say no, write down. So this will protect the confidentiality of high-level objects. So even if in the presence of a spy or a malicious or a malware in a high-level process, there is no way for information to flow down from the top to the bottom. So this ensure confidentiality. The BIPA model is completely opposite. Okay. It is no write up, no read down. No write up, no read down. Okay. So a high level process can read write high level, low level can read write low level. A high level process, there's a little man here, he can write into or modified low level objects. However, a low level process cannot, okay, this one is not possible. He cannot write into the high level objects. He cannot modify high level projects. And then for reading, for reading a low level project, in this case, he, he actually can read the high level objects but the low level of uh, high level this process cannot read. It cannot read a low level project. In this way, you can see that we cannot have information going up. Right? So now there's a no way for a low level processors, okay, to support their malware here, okay, to corrupt the information of in here. Okay, if this, this part is corrupted, this part is corrupted, okay, there's no way that uh, due to this access control, the high level object remains safe. So PIPA model ensure integrity of the high level objects. So these two are uh, two uh, models. Uh, very interesting, they are opposite of each other. And very seldom, uh, when you ask me, you ask which computer system, uh, fast system, use this model. In fact, there is none. Okay. And, um, but ne nevertheless, it serves as a good exercise and a good uh, guideline in, in other design. Let's look at a specific example. Use, use Unix file system as uh, examples. I skip this, skip this, skip this. In a Unix system, the objects uh, we consider are data, like files, directories, the memory, okay? So you look at the computer system, let's say Unix is an OS, okay? The OS handle many things. The files, okay, files are the data, and the memory, okay, the computer CPU memory, these are different from the storage, right? This is storage, this are memory. And there are also I.O. devices, such as a keyboard, keyboard, 
mouse, okay, the display monitor, okay, and the printer, printer. So these are all uh, resources, okay, resources uh, managed by the computer system. And in Unix, it's a treated the, all. Okay, let me clear the slide first. In Unix, all these resources, just I mentioned, which I mentioned, the the files. Just let me draw it. Okay, it's a OS. OS handle the files. Okay, uh, keyboard. Okay, and so on, so on. Okay, in Unix, they take a very uh, interesting approach. Okay, all these are treated as files. All are files. Okay, a keyboard is also a files. A, a display monitor, a printer is also a files. If you want to get data from the keyboard, we read from the keyboard files. If you want to print something to a printer, send something to a printer, we write to the printer files. And also, executable programs or applications are also files. Okay. So if you run this command, I believe at this time, everyone knows what is this command ls-al, which lists down all the files in the directory. As you do, is in fact a program. Okay, uh, executable files. That's why we call it executable file, indicated by this X. Okay, we can run the program by executing sudo. This is a command. In here, my program.c is treated as a data. It's a data, the source uh, code of this uh, programs. And what is stdin? This is stand for standard standard input which is a keyboard. keyboard so the keyboard is a file if you want to get something from a keyboard we read from stdin there's a directory slash dev okay if you are in ubuntu you can take a look at it now if you have a mac a mac uh, apple mac os is based on unix okay um, so you go to this directory stretch dev dev stands for device d e v i c e so these are all the input output devices okay look at all the directory all the file there you can see standard input the keyboard standard output the one to display on the screen and there is the device that generate uh three uh, random variable So just as an illustration, in case you are not aware of that, uh, can I, can I, I'll see. Wait. Let me share the my screen of my prompt. Okay. So this for this we see all the files. Okay. And we can, if I want to display a file, I use the word cat, right? Cat, uh, cat, my pods. This will display the files, okay? You can also, um, cat, dv, you, random, okay? You can display this device and this list down all the pseudo, uh, uh, uh random sequence. Now back to our uh, lectures.
and for every false, okay, for every false, the the permission. Okay, I'm sorry. Let me clear my. Let's look at these files, okay? Who have access to this file? This is specified by this file permission bit. Okay, there are nine of them, okay, nine of them. And this part is the access by the owner. This specified the access right by the group member, group member, and this part by all the rest, the others. Okay. And the owner of these files is Alice, and Alice belongs to the group staff. Okay. So each of it describes the access right. For example, when this R means that Alice can read this file, right means Alice can write these files. And if it's dash, that means that the even the group member cannot write or modify the files. The last one is X. Last one is X. Okay. When it's X, means that this file can be executed to be run as a program. Okay. So if it's X, means Alice can execute this file. You put your X here, Alice can execute this file. If you have an X here, it means that anyone, anyone, including Alice, can execute the files. The principal here are the users, like Alice, okay? and the groups. Okay, the, all the information about uh, this, okay, the subjects, okay, remember we have, there's a, in the access control, there's a subjects, objects, okay? Objects are the files, okay? The subjects are actually processors, okay? They are processors, which are later I'm going to, I'll show you, explain more, who want to access the files. Okay. At this point in time, uh, let's temporarily we treat the processors are uh, similar to the, uh, the principles, okay? but they are different, which I'll go into detail later. Okay, the, without, right now, we treat the processors are uh, just the principle. So some uh, additional remark on the password file. There's one file that's very special, it's called slash etc password. Okay. This file is well readable. That means everyone can read this file. Why it's required? Because it describes the grouping. Uh, you describe uh, many, many informations. Uh, for example, the address or the phone number of the user and so on. In the earlier version of uh, Unix, okay, the star here, let me look at here, this star here, okay, is in fact the hash of the password. Okay, remember every user to use a system has a password and we, we never store the password in clear. We hash them and store it. Okay, in the earlier design, this is the hash of the password. We also learned that there's something called offline dictionary attacks. Okay. So very often the password is of low entropy and then we can carry out the offline dictionary attacks to find out what is the password. So now if this file is well readable, that means everyone can read this file, that means everyone can access to the hash of the password. Then you say, oh, it's fine, the hash of the password is not the actual password itself. But by carrying out, carrying out dictionary attacks, potentially if the password entropy is low, attacker can get it. So there is a no reason that we have to give the world have access to the hash. Okay, even by the least hubris principle, we should disallow that. Okay. And thus in the earlier, uh, in the 
more reason are uh, in the reason version okay this the the this is removed okay it's removed okay the hash of the password is no longer stay, stored here it's stored in somewhere else that is not well readable but for password uh, backward compatibility backward compatibility so a star is being put here So as I just mentioned, uh, the the processes, okay, okay, the subject are the processes, okay. And let me show you if you, okay. Let me show you how do you see all the processes in your system. You can execute. Uh, this command ps minus dash alx let's show you uh, this cut okay and have this again let me share the screen of my command plot The command ps will list down the processes. Okay, if you type ps minus a, then add it. So you can see there are three processes running here. And ps uh, minus axl, axl, it lists down all the processes, okay, in currently running in my machine. Okay, a special user is a super user. The UID of super user, uh, super user is zero. So now suppose a process, okay, we know the process, which is a subject, want to access, okay, a subject, okay, this is a process, want to access a file, let's say F1. Okay. Want to read or want to write or want to delete, okay, or execute. This request will send to a reference monitor. The reference monitor will decide whether to grant or deny the asset. So as the reference monitor will follow a set of rules. Okay, this is the rules. This is a rule. Okay. So how does it check the rules? Okay. In the Unix file system using ACL access control list. So every files okay, will list down who have the right. To operate on this file and the acl in fact in unix is very simple it's just that nine bits the nine bits uh, nine bits over here okay the nine bits and edit processes will be associated with a, a, a process id and then it inherit the the uh, okay suppose it's a user a at least at least invoke this this process then this processes will inherit the so-called uid the user id of alice okay so now when the subjects okay you can create a, want to access this file okay the reference monitor the server guard will check Okay, first you check whether the user is the owner. Okay, and then then check this uh, bit, this uh, this part of the bit. Then you check whether the user is the group, is the same group or the address. Okay, so I leave it to you to read the details. Okay, okay let's take. In the second part, I will talk about uh, this issue, control invocations. Control invocations and privilege 
elevations. The access control gives a binary outcome, uh, whether a subject can access, can read an object, or the subject can not read the objects. There's nothing in the in between. So this may give uh, some problems. Let's consider these situations where we have a staff files. Okay? The files contain contacts of staff members and thus is very sensitive. So we don't want to give uh, any normal user have the access right to read and write to these files. So now, suppose there is an Alice. Alice want to uh, read these files Alice go to his computer, lock in, lock in at Alice, and then the process will inherit the 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 Alice write. Okay, so go to the reference monitor. Reference monitor say that okay, you want to access. Okay, let me check the ACL. Okay, you have no write, and then deny access. But sometimes Alice want to modify certain part of the files which referee she have the right to do so like uh, this contain all the phone number at least want to uh, update her own phone number want to update her phone number now this uh, not able to do it okay we are not able to do it because we either giving access or do giving access and all program that is uh, uh, invoked by Alice will inherit the right of Alice and then it doesn't have access. So how do we handle this case? The method is use what we call control escalation. So there is a pre a set of predefined application. These are applications. This application is given elevated beverage. This application given elevated beverage, and normal user cannot create such high beverage application. Only the root uh, can do so. However, any user like Alice, he can call these applications. So now if Alice wants to modify her record in the staff.txt, Alice will call these applications. Let's say I want to change. And this application will request write access and read access of this. And reference monitor will let them go in. So in some sense, Alice can still indirectly modified data here but she can only do so through the this predefined uh, programs okay so we call this predefined program breaches breaches okay so uh, Alice still can indirectly modify assess the sensitive files but only through the predefined application this predefined applications it's written very carefully to make sure that Alice can only do what she, uh, she allowed to do. Uh, we have seen this before in our tutorial on the firewall design. We have talked about the web server and the SQL server. A uh, user is anyone in the internet. We say that we have a requirement that the user cannot directly send any query to the SQL database server. Okay, so we don't allow this. However, if the user wants to access the SQL server, SQL server, he can do so indirectly through some application, the web server. Okay, the web server have a list of applications, the user access them, and the application, this application, uh, send the query to the SQL server. So there's so um, due because of this, there's only a limited uh, a query, okay, that will be generated by the bank. Okay. So in that sense, this web server is a bridge. Is a bridge. So this bridge has to be correctly uh, carefully implemented if they are not implemented correctly contain bugs okay 
and then this bug can be exploited and this will create a problems right uh, like uh, for example attacker may somehow use a bridge to perform arbitrary operations okay and now because uh, the process is run in the elevated privilege and a test of this form is also known as beverage escalations okay so these are pictures okay there are bridges which bug okay and the user is aware of this bug the user may able to craft the input in a very smart way so that to create uh, to to carry out operation they are not a lot uh, originally not allowed to do so okay same for the this uh, bank applications okay something like which we'll do later like sql injections through sql injection attacks and then the user can submit arbitrary query to the sql server okay. this is possible due to the bugs okay to the bugs okay. let's look at the detail how uh, units uh, implement the control invocations Okay, you need to do so by having something called real UID and effective UID. Let us recap the UNIX file system. Uh, the files is the objects and the processes. A process is a subject. Okay. And the uh, every process is associated with a user. Okay, so when a you uh, suppose Ellie is locked into a system, okay, after she successfully locked in, a process will be uh, created, and this process will have the user ID of Alice. And after Alice uh, lock in, Alice may invoke uh, many application that like open a browser. Okay, open a music player okay this uh, the browser and music player are actually invoked by the locking uh, process uh, process so all these subsequently uh, uh, evoked processes will inherit the at least uh, user IDs so when a process want to access a files uh, objects the reference monitor will check Okay, the user ID and the access control as we have mentioned before. To facilitate the control invocations, okay, the unit file system do something more. Okay. Every process actually is associated with two user ID. Okay. One is called the real UID, uh, real UID. The other one is the effective UID. Okay. Real UID is just on what uh, as uh, described. Okay, uh, you inherit from the parent uh, uh, process. So now, okay, so a process, okay, have um, a process. Suppose this is a process. Okay, this is a process. It can invoke an R process. It can fault out an R process. Okay, so so the if this a UID, the real UID, and this will inherit, this will inherit the same real UID. It can also it also uh, a process can be also be created by executing a false by executing a false. When a file is generated, okay, suppose uh, the Alice execute a false, okay, then the real UID of this process, okay, will be Alice, okay, it inherit from the the person who execute the false. What about the effective UID? Okay, the e effective UID is determined by two. Uh, two fields. One is a flag called set UID flags, and the other one is the owner of the files. Okay, let's give these examples. Okay, so 
Alice can evoke a process by executing these files. Okay. So you look at this field, this means that this file is executable. When Alice executes this file, the process, okay, the real UID of this file, of this process is Alice. The effective UID is also Alice. However, if the so-called set UID, set uh, UID flag is on, so how do I know the set UID flag is on? By looking at this field. If this S indicate that S UID is enabled. If set UID is on, the effective UID is root, okay, which is the sorry about that, which is the owner of this file. That means that if the set UID is on, the effective UID follow the owner of the files. Okay, this is specified here. If the set is enabled, the then the process effectivity uh, UID is read from the UID of the file owner. So why we want to design in this way? Okay, let's look at the examples. Okay, of uh, uh, when compared to when set UID is disabled or set UID is enabled. So let's look at uh, these files. This file is sensitive. This file is sensitive, contain all the employee information. That's why we set it to be non-word readable. Okay. This file employee.txt is owned by the root and is set to be a non-word readable. So no one can read this file except the root. But now we want to uh, allow Alice to edit this file, at least for his own field. Alice want to update her phone numbers. So the way we do it is to create a bridge, a bridge, uh, and this bridge name is called edit profile. Okay, so we, we write, we program or create an application which name is edit profiles. This edit profile is a word executable, so anyone can execute it. Okay. Alice can also execute these files. Okay. So when Alice execute this file, okay, when Alice execute these files, then the, the process, okay, the real UID of this process will be Alice. And the effective UID of this process is also Alice. Okay. And now when this process, okay, when this process want to read or write the employee.txe according to this uh, uh, ACL, the security guard there will deny access. Okay, will not give access to this. But when SUID is enabled, suppose SUID is enabled here. Okay. Now when Alice execute this file, execute this file, the real UID of these processors, okay, there's a processors, okay, uh, created by executing this file, uh, executing this program edit profile. The real UID will be Alice that according to the rules, because set UID is on, the effective UID will follow the owner. The owner is root. So the effective UID is root. Now the security guard, okay? Look at this, okay, the effective UID is root. And look at the access right. Okay, root has read right access. So the security guard grant access, uh, uh, read right access to this process. And now at least, this process, Alice can indirectly um, update her phone numbers. So in this example, the process edit profile is temporarily ele elevated to super user, that means the root, so that he can access the sensitive data. 
Um, so these are the predefined bridges that I have mentioned before. And I also mentioned that it's important that this bridge, I mean this program, edit a profile to be written correctly. If there are mistakes in this file or there are bugs in these files, then because uh, that uh, pot potentially, at least who is malicious, he may able to craft the input carefully so that's to corrupt the sensitive files. So if such case ha happen, we usually call this a uh, escalation attacks, people rich escalation attacks. So this leads up to another topics in next lectures is on secure programming. That means that we have to make sure that the program that's written, this type of program written is secure. So there are some footnotes here, you can take a look and Let's go to the next lectures.